get started. Sorry, it was a couple of minutes late. Um, good evening, and for those of you who don't know, know me, my name's Debbie Terry, and I'm the Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor uh, here at the University of Queensland. And can I extend a warm welcome to everybody who is here, and particularly to our international guest speaker. I hope you enjoy your visit to uh, Queensland, Eric. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we gather and obviously pay my respects to Elders past and present. Acknowledge uh, Professor Eric Olin Wright, our University of Wisconsin-Madison and our guest lecturer tonight, members of the uh, University Senior Management Group, uh, representatives from the University's Institute for Social Science Research and the School of Social Science who have uh, jointly sponsored tonight's event, Obviously, Professor Mark Weston, Director of the Institute for Social Science Research, and Professor David Trigger, Head of the School of Social Science. Our UQ colleagues, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's lecture, as I think everybody is aware, honours the late Emeritus Professor John Weston AM, who is widely regarded as being the founding father of sociology at the University of Queensland. I was honoured to attend the inaugural John Weston Memorial Lecture delivered in 2011 by Professor John Braithwaite from ANU. And this biennial lecture sees us return this year to welcome another distinguished and internationally renowned sociologist, Professor Eric Owen Wright. And Professor Wright, as I said, I'm delighted that you could join us and Mark Weston is going to formally introduce you in a moment. But before we do that, if you could just indulge me while I say a few words about the man we're honouring tonight. Professor John Weston was born in Adelaide in 1931 and grew up in Melbourne. And he initially studied psychology and social psychology at the University of Melbourne and then went on to study social studies before gaining his PhD in sociology at Columbia University in 1962. Returning to Australia, he took up a position in the Department of Psychology at ANU and later moved to the University of Queensland to take up a senior lectureship in government prior to moving to sociology. Having begun my own uh, research career in social psychology at ANU, I would of course be tempted to say at some point John moved over to the dark side, but I'm not sure that I'd get much support in the audience here tonight to debate whether social psychology or sociology is in fact the best career. In 1970, John was in fact then appointed as the first professor of sociology at the University of Queensland in a position he held until he retired in 1996. And he went on, as everybody knows here, or many people do, to make really many, many significant contributions to the field, publishing more than 50 books, monographs and commissioned reports, 70 book chapters and 120 journal articles. He built one of the largest and most successful sociology departments in the country here at UQ. He was a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. And in 2009, he became a member in the General Division of the Order of Australia for his contributions to tertiary education and to sociology. He was president of the Australian and New Zealand Sociological Association and the inaugural president of the Asia Pacific Association in Sociology, a body that he helped to establish. Professor Weston's efforts in the social sciences transcended across borders way before that was the norm in academia, way before we talked about internationalisation and globalisation. And this was reinforced to me just a few weeks ago when I was uh, on a recent university, uh, on a university mission to Indonesia, as I say, just a few weeks ago. And while I was there, I had the privilege of meeting Dr Adrianus Meliala, uh, a criminologist at the University of Indonesia, a commissioner, commissioner of the National Police Commission in Indonesia, and an advisor to the Minister of Law and Human Rights on, on Detention. And uh, Adrianus was our guest alumni speaker at, at, our, uh, at our alumni event. And in his speech, he spoke very fondly about his time at UQ. He mentioned all the things that people mention about UQ. Uh, but he particularly dwelled on his experiences with John as his PhD supervisor. And he spent quite a lot of time talking about John Weston and how much he owed John and uh, how much he liked working with John and the group. And, and he, he, he said what really impressed him was John's ability to make complex things very simple. And this ranged apparently from John's efforts not only to help him navigate the complexities of the literature and the theory in his field, 
but also, perhaps less interesting but no less complex, helped him manage the challenges of simply enrolling as a PhD student at UQ, and he told us a lot about the challenges of enrolling at UQ. And he said to me, I'm sure, I'm sure it's much easier now, and I said, I'm not <laughs> entirely sure that we've got that all right, but uh, he said John Weston was the person who understood how to get it done. Professor Weston, as, as we all know, sadly passed away in January 2011. But as Professor Trigger said at that time, his legacy will continue through the work of his two sons, Mark and Bruce, who are both sociologists. Mark is the director of UQ's Institute for Social Science Research, and Bruce is Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. On this note, so I'm delighted to welcome, obviously, Professor Mark Weston, who will formally introduce tonight's speaker. Mark is, uh, has been in the role for five years as director of our Institute for Social Science Research. He too is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. He too has worked previously at ANU and at the University of Tasmania. And he's held visiting appointments at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Manchester uh, and the Institute of Education in London. He's held research grants and, go and government contracts worth of approximately $20 million. He's edited and authored six books, 90 book chapters, journal articles and commission reports. So both personally and professionally, Mark is the most appropriate person to introduce tonight's John Weston Memorial Lecture and the person who will present that lecture to us. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Debbie, for, for those very kind words about, about my father and um, welcome colleagues and guests. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and welcome especially to Eric. Uh, we're, we're very glad to have you here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Professor Eric Owen Wright um, tonight to present the 2013 John Weston Memorial Lecture which is jointly hosted by the School of Social Science and the Institute for Social Science Research. Eric um, is the Vilas Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the immediate past president of the American Sociological Association. He's one of the world's leading exponents of Marxian theory and of class analysis. And anybody who's been interested in class analysis, the state, Marxian theory, inequality, alternative futures to capitalism, in the last 35 or 40 years will have encountered Eric's work. He's consistently addressed some of the most important topics in the social sciences. He's attempted to develop rigorous theory and combine that with rigorous empirical analysis to develop a genuinely emancipatory social science that incorporates a vision of the world as we'd like it, as well as an analysis of the world as it is. Within sociology and social science, Eric's work is distinctive for its theoretical clarity for its coherence, for its logical precision, and for Eric's willingness to refine and modify his own positions in the light of reasoned argument and evidence. He's also very largely overcome the traditional division of labor in the social sciences between theory um, and empirical research. Now, if it were just for his public accomplishments and the esteem in which he's held, then Eric would be the fitting person to present the 2013 John Weston Memorial Lecture. But it's really much for many other reasons that he is an appropriate person. In the 1970s and 1980s, Eric was fundamentally concerned with trying to theorize and understand the nature of class relations in contemporary capitalist societies. And in the 1970s in particular, he developed a tremendously influential theory. In 1982, Eric wrote a National Science Foundation grant, um, proposal to establish an international comparative project examining class structure, class biography, and class consciousness in contemporary societies. This is actually a copy of the, um, the core of the 1982 National Science Foundation proposal that Eric wrote. In Australia, Bob Holton, who was a sociologist then at the University of Flinders, um, adopted Eric's questionnaire and carried out a pilot study um, in, I think, 1983. And another team at UQ, that was led by John Weston, who was professor of sociology, and accompanied by a number of young Turks, Paul Borum, Mike Emerson, Stuart Clegg, wrote a large grant application to try to establish an Australian version of um, the international project, the Australian component of the comparative project on class structure and class consciousness. The Australian team received funding um, on the second time round, uh, not back the first time, but resubmitted. Um, and the Australian Class Project was established and ran a national survey in 1986. 
John Weston led the Australian team, as I said, and among others, it included several PhD students, Janine Baxter, Gary Marks, who is now at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Social and Economic Research, and Mark Weston. Australian class project was one of the first big quantitative national studies in Australian sociology, and probably the first to be part of a very large international study. In the first rounds, I think Eric's comparative project incorporated 10 countries, um, but it grew progressively larger. The Australian project was also a model for how to provide PhD training, um, particularly how to provide an apprenticeship style training built around large team-based projects. And in this way, it reflected John Weston's own PhD training in Columbia in the, in the late 1950s, as, as Debbie has said. The Australian class project was tremendously exciting and dynamic. It hung together intellectually and collegially in a way which for me has been really very distinctive. And I can still remember favourably project meetings that we held in the Mickey building in the 1980s. Um, and it, it was an incredible experience. In 1987, um, Janine Baxter and I were PhD students working on the Australian project. And at John Weston's insistence and through Eric's generosity, we had the opportunity to go to Madison and work with Eric for about a year. Uh, for me, it was a life-changing experience. Um, the quality of the graduate training, the opportunity to work with Eric, the time we spent sort of um, sitting in this, in this small room in the Social Sciences Building, five members of the, of the sort of the project team who are all Eric's students and RAs. It was just an incredible sort of experience. And in Madison in 1987, we also became very close friends with two other Australian graduate students of Eric's. Bill Martin and Maria Zadorozny, who are, who are here tonight and now also work at UQ. Janine and I went back to Wisconsin in 1991 and we worked with Eric for another two years and it was just as exciting the second time round as it was the first. John Weston and Eric Wright had some very important things in common. Both were committed to doing the best sociology they could, deeply committed to the possibilities of the discipline and deeply committed to academia. Both believe that sociology can make a real difference in the world, and both have directly affected thousands of researchers, graduate students, and scholars through their generosity and their willingness to teach and share what they know. It gives me particular pleasure tonight to introduce Professor Eric Olin Wright to give the 2013 John Weston Memorial Lecture. I, um, in coming to Brisbane, it occurred to me that the highest concentration of students who have worked very closely with me in the world is located in, actually, in this room tonight. <laughs> I don't think there's any other university that has four students uh, who have had that kind of close relationship. And I know for absolutely sure there's no place that has four students who I love so dearly. Uh, you're incredibly lucky to have this quartet. They are fantastic in every respect. I also hadn't realized that um, John got his PhD in 1962 because uh, I wanted to begin the talk about talking about something that happened in 1962. So just as John was finishing his PhD at Columbia, a group of young leftish students mostly from the University of Michigan, met in the summer at a place in Michigan called Port Huron to craft a manifesto which came to be known as the Port Huron Statement. This is the founding document of Students for Democratic Society. 1962. 1962 is still part of the 50s. The 60s actually begin very shortly after, about 1962. In this document, they wrote the introductory section was called Agenda for a Generation. And I'd like to just read a few words from that introduction. In this is perhaps the outstanding paradox. We ourselves are imbued with urgency, yet the message of our society is that there is no viable alternative to the present. Beneath the stagnation of those who have closed their minds to the future, is the pervading feeling that there simply are no alternatives, that our times have witnessed the exhaustion, not only of utopias, but of any new departures as well. 
Doubt has replaced hopefulness, and people act out of defeatism that is labeled realistic. The decline of utopia and hope is, in fact, one of the defining features of social life today. Could have been written yesterday, 50 years ago. But within five years, 1968, the iconic moment of the 60s, one of the slogans on the walls in France and Paris in 68 was, soyez réaliste, demandez l'impossible. Be realistic, demand the impossible. But it wasn't too long after, in the early 80s, when Margaret Thatcher said famously, there is no alternative, and the acronym TINA was born as a way of encapsulating the ambitions of neoliberalism, not the reality of the world, but the ambitions of a particular ideological project to render the notion of alternative illegitimate and illusory. In 2001, the World Social Forum began its first year under the slogan, Another World is Possible. And now we are in 2013. I like to think, perhaps, that um, the sense of alternative is brewing and that just as in 1962, no one would have expected the explosive, transformative cultural and political phenomena of the 60s to uh, have occurred. It was not predicted by the actors who wrote the manifest manifesto. They hoped that their manifesto, that the Students for Democratic Society, which it began, would be participants as collective agents in a transformative project. But I doubt very much if they predicted the way the 60s would unfold. Well, perhaps we are on the cusp of a similar period of energetic efforts at revitalizing the idea of alternative. There are, of course, smoldering moments that suggest that. Uh, the, the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring in a different context, of course, the Greek protests. In my state of Wisconsin two years ago, we had the most um, energetic protests in the state's history, 150,000 people at its peak protesting in Madison, a city of uh, 200,000 people. They weren't all Madisonians, of course, but, uh, and um, a 17-day occupation of the state capitol building. Nevertheless, I think it is still the case that we live in an era when most people really do feel there isn't much of an alternative. The response to the crisis that we confront is not that this is an opportunity to forge a fundamentally new path into the future, but this is a time to buckle down and to accept the pain of austerity. Well, it's in this context that the idea of real utopias and the Real Utopias Project, which, uh, of which, which is labeled by this slogan, uh, the idea of real utopias was born. It's an attempt to provide us with theoretical tools to seriously interrogate the possibility of alternative, to maintain deep and unapologetic commitments to emancipatory ideals, while at the same time equally committed to the pragmatic problem of creating real institutions that actually work. Real and utopia don't go together very well, right? I mean, utopia, the word, it's a pun. I don't know how many of you know the history. Uh, Thomas More invented the word using two Greek prefixes to topos. Topos is place, and the two prefixes sound the same in English, more or less. EU and OU, meaning perfect and nowhere. So utopia is the perfect nowhere place. How can it be real? Well, of course, it's a provocation to say real utopia. The utopia part of real utopia means we should look for alternatives to dominant institutions that embody our deepest aspirations for a just and humane world. And I say without apology. We should have a kind of open-hearted and non-cynical, passionate engage embrace of emancipatory ideals without, in the first instance, worrying about their realistic possibilities. 
but an embrace of those emancipatory ideals is just not enough. And we certainly can't be content with the, what I like to call the charismatic wishful thinking that where there's a will, there's a way, and all we have to do is care enough about those values in order if we have the power to put them in place. And thus we need real utopias, the search for alternatives to dominant institutions that are attentive to problems of unintended consequences, self-destructive dynamics, and the difficult dilemmas of normative trade-offs. We need to combine these two kinds of intellectual and political groundings or impulses. The desire for the visionary idealism of an emancipatory alternative with an equally committed desire for ins to build institutions that actually work, are sustainable, and solve the problems which we see. Well, that's the idea, the grand idea of real utopias. What I'd like to do in the talk tonight is to sketch out the main elements of the framework that I've been working on in which we can locate this idea of real utopias, give it a, a kind of theoretical grounding. I refer to this broad theoretical uh, architecture for the real utopias. I refer to it as emancipatory social science. That's, I hope, doesn't sound too pretentious as a way of describing it. I label it that way rather than sort of neo-Marxism or reconstructed Marxism, even though in my own thinking, the Marxist tradition provides absolutely foundational elements of this broad framework. But I do that in a genuine spirit of openness to, um, and recognition that there are a variety of critical perspectives that don't ground their analysis in class, which are equally central to the emancipatory project. And thus, I, I felt it was better to kind of identify the overall agenda as emancipatory social science rather than more specifically, the version of emancipatory social science within which I do my own work. So here's what I want to do in the talk. I want to sketch the essential elements that I use in my development of these ideas, and I do so around four principal tasks. Now these are four tasks that I think any emancipatory theory has to deal with. Uh, feminism has to tackle these four tasks in one way or another. Radical environmentalism has to tackle these four tasks in one way or another. So I want to lay out these four tasks and explain how I've elaborated substance. I want to put content into this. So the first task is establishing the moral foundations for an emancipatory social science. What indeed are the ideals to which we aspire? The second task is diagnosis and critique evaluating existing institutions in light of those moral foundations. The third is the elaboration of alternatives that better realize the moral foundations that are found wanting through the diagnosis and critique of existing institutions. And finally, elaborating a theory of transformation. You might want to think of this as uh, moral foundations provide us with a motivation Diagnosis and critique tells us why we want to leave the world in which we live. A theory of alternative tells us something about where we want to go, and a theory of transformation helps us understand how to get from here to there. So first, let's look at moral foundations. Now, I, um, in, the, in the spirit of really wanting to allow time for discussion and questions, I'm going to try to be very punchy, uh, particularly around this part, I, I find if I don't discipline myself, I really like talking about these moral foundations. I think there's a part of me that, in which my, my deepest intellectual kind of impulse is philosophical, more than even sociological. So, but, so I can easily end up talking for an hour on these four principles. What I'm gonna do is state them and in each case, I'll just point to some salient feature, but I will not give a defense of these moral foundations. The first principle is the, is the principle of equality. In a just society, all persons would have broadly equal access to the material and social means to live flourishing lives. 
that's a complicated statement. There's lots of elements. Those of you who do political philosophy and are familiar with sort of contemporary egalitarian liberal theories of justice will recognize key components here. Let me just mention one. I mean, I, again, I could, there's a lot to elaborate. Let me just explain the equal access idea. The standard way that people think about fairness in contemporary society, certainly in the United States and Australia, is the notion of equal opportunity. That's the watch, the watch word. What we want is a society where all people have equal opportunity. Now, I think equal opportunity is a good thing. The world is a better place where there's equal opportunity rather than unequal opportunity. Equal opportunity is an aspect of fairness, but I don't think it's strong enough, and I don't think it captures the real moral intuition that most people actually have when they think about it systematically. Equal opportunity, after all, is consistent with a lottery. Right? A lottery in which some people, as long as they have an equal chance and some people live flourishing lives and other people lives of desperation just by chance, but as long as everybody had an equal chance, it's equal opportunity. Well, clearly that's not a desirable standard by which we judge the fairness of a system. But more fundamentally, I think equal opportunity um, is sociologically an unrealistic way of thinking about the, the life course. Uh, the usual in interpretation of equal opportunity is starting gate equality. So long as all people are at, have an equal chance at the time they are young adults, then if some become fabulously wealthy and other destitute, too bad, they had equal opportunity. Starting gate, playing, equal playing field, right? The sports metaphors are rampant in this kind of discussion. Well, given what we know, particularly about the myopia of young adults and the foibles of making choices and the lack of, uh, of, the, of a human capacity to think far into the future in many circumstances, it's, um, it's a pretty absurd idea that you've created a fair world so long as at age 20 everybody had an equal chance and that you don't have to worry at all about access to the conditions to live a flourishing life after that initial point. Well, that's why I think equal access is a richer idea. It's a more demanding idea. It means that throughout the life course, all people should have equal access to the conditions necessary to live a flourishing life. Of course, there's lots of objections, many complications in this formulation, but that is the core value by which I judge institutions as whether or not they are fair. Second principle is democracy. In a fully democratic society, all people would have broadly equal access to the necessary means to participate meaningfully in decisions about things which affect their lives. The core moral principle underlying democracy is self-determination. People should be able to control, to participate in the decisions that affect their lives rather than have their lives determined by the choices of others. When the choices and questions affect you and only you, then the democracy principle or the self-determination principle is the, is, is the same as liberty. Individual liberty is simply the view that you should be able to make choices um, as long as they don't affect other people without asking anyone's permission. That's what liberty is. Uh, when your choices, however, have significant effects on the lives of other people, they should be co-participants in the decision. It's that simple. If you make choices which have big impacts on other people, they should be a co-participant. They may say, fine, you just make the decision. That's okay. You know, they can decide not to participate, but a fully democratic society that deeply honors the principle of self-determination says, when decisions affect the lives of other people, they should be part of the decision-making process. And as we'll see in a moment, that's most fundamentally why capitalism is incompatible with democracy. It's simply not possible in a capitalist society for people to be co-participants in decisions which affect their lives so long as private property rights give people the ability to move a factory to another country because they can maximize their personal benefit by doing so. That is inconsistent with the foundational ideal that democracy represents. The third value or principle is community or solidarity, community and solidarity. I couple these two together. Community and solidarity expresses the principle 
that people ought to cooperate with each other, not simply because of what they personally get out of it, but also out of a real commitment to the well-being of others. That's what it means to live in community with others. When this refers to the mundane interactions of everyday life, the way we cooperate just in ordinary social interaction, I think the word community is typically used. When it's used in the context of collective action, getting together collectively to accomplish something as a group, uh, the word solidarity is more typically used. But in both cases, the idea of community and solidarity indicates that the basis of cooperation is not merely the self-interest of each person, although self-interest is perfectly legitimate as part of the reason for participating. It's also a concern for the well-being of others. That's what the value of community and solidarity means, or at least it means as in the way I'm going to use it. And finally, sustainability. Future generations should have access to the social and material means to live flourishing lives at least at the same level as the present generation. This way of defining sustainability uh, has a close connection to the definition of equality. You, one way of thinking about it is that the principle of equality is about social justice among people alive today, whereas the principle of Sustainability is about social justice for people in the future. This is an anthropocentric view of sustainability. It's an unapologetically person-centered, human-centered view of the environment. It says we should care about the environment because human flourishing depends upon the environment and uh, it is unjust to deprive future generations of the material or natural conditions to live flourishing lives. Some environmentalists object to this anthropocentric view of sustainability. I think they incorrectly assume that because it's anthropocentric, it gives license to be destructive of the environment. But it doesn't. I mean, that's clearly not the case. The, uh, this anthropocentric view insists that the environment be protected for future generations, which is a demanding restriction, not a weak restriction. And there are very few instances, I think, in which a nature-centric view of uh, sustainability and an anthropocentric view, there are very few circumstances in which they would actually collide. And we're so far away from the point of collision of those two, of those two bases that I don't think it matters. Well, those are the four principles. So when I do my work and when I think about existing institutions and the kind of world I would like to help or contribute to forging, I ask of those institutions how well do they perform uh, institutions and social structures with respect to equality, democracy, community, and sustainability. And that leads to the diagnosis and critique of capitalism. Now I'm focusing on capitalism here. We could, we could do the same thing around um, gender relations, around family, around other aspects of social life. Uh, my focus here will be on capitalism. How well does capitalism fare with respect to these four core values of an emancipatory, of at least the kind of emancipatory social science which I'm proposing? First on equality. Capitalism inherently generates levels of inequality in income and wealth that systematically violate social justice. It's an inherent, not a contingent feature of capitalism that it distributes wealth and income in such a way that some people have enormous access to the material conditions to live flourishing lives and other people have um, lived lives of deprivation and marginalization. That's not a contingent feature of capitalism, it's an intrinsic feature of a economic system which distributes its resources through a competitive process in which your ability to compete depends upon the resources you've already acquired. And that's what capitalism does. It rewards that kind of dynamic. Democracy. Capitalism generates severe deficits in realizing democratic values by excluding crucial decisions from public deliberation, by allowing private wealth to affect access to political power, and by allowing workplace dictatorships. Uh, capitalism doesn't require 
workplace dictatorships. A capitalist is perfectly free to say to the employees of his or her firm, uh, we will create a, an employee assembly and uh, I will follow whatever the assembly decides as the strategic priorities. No capitalist does this, but it's within the power of capitalists to do so. Uh, the critique is that it allows workplace dictatorships and indeed in, in virtually all contexts um, that is the central form of the employment relation with degrees of um, domination within such a dictatorial relationship. The first of these I think is the most fundamental. I've already mentioned it. Private property means that if you are the owner of a or the delegate of the owner of the means of production, and you can increase your rate of profit by moving your production to some other place, you do not have to take into consideration the impact on the lives of other people. Simply does not have to enter into your decision at all. And furthermore, if those people insist, if they say, hey, you're moving the factory from our town is going to destroy the livelihoods of 10,000 people and wreck the property values of everybody in the town because of the rise of unemployment and we have to be part of the decision making uh, and you take the person to court and say I'm going to sue you, you didn't include us, you'd be laughed out of court. You have no right to be included in a decision that massively affects your lives. That is fundamentally undemocratic. Now an important thing to note is that while this is I think unequivocally undemocratic, it still could be reasonable to say, okay, it's undemocratic. That's life. You know, you can't have everything. You have many values. Uh, capitalism is so beneficial in other respects that it's better to allow workplace dictatorships and these deeply undemocratic ways of allocating resources. It's better to just allow people to do it on the basis of self-interest, uh, even though it violates individual uh, democratic values. It's better to do it because the gains of prosperity, let's say, outweigh the deficits in the de decline of democracy. That would be a reasonable argument to make. You know, that is one could, I disagree that the trade-off is necessary. I think we can have democracy and prosperity, but it would be an honest argument. What's not an honest argument is to say capitalism embodies principles of democracy. That's simply a false claim. It does not embody principles of democracy. It embodies principles of individuals being able to use the power that comes from their wealth to massively affect the lives of other people without those other people having any say in the matter. That's foundational to the notion of a capitalist economic system. Third principle, community solidarity. Competition and commodification within capitalism undermine community solidarity. They constantly reinforce the idea that, that you're on your own, that you need to compete with others, that your ability to acquire the necessary means to live a flourishing life depends upon how well you compete. Competition in that sense cuts against cooperation on the basis of concern for the well-being of others. You do cooperate with others, but on the condition that it's beneficial for you. That's the kind of thinking and the kind of social practices that gets encouraged by an economic system that is grounded in the competition between people as the central mechanism by which uh, people accomplish their goals in life. Finally, sustainability. Capitalism inherently threatens the quality of the environment for future generations because of imperatives for consumerism and endless growth. Endless growth is not a contingent feature of capitalism. The imperative to seek endless growth is an intrinsic feature of a capitalist system where capitalists compete with each other over market shares to realize uh, profits through the investment of their resources. And endless growth is inconsistent with the sustainability of the environment. And that's why in the current crisis, uh, no politicians celebrate the stagnation of the economy. N nobody says, thank God, we finally have reached a period where capitalism is stagnant 
Maybe we can even go towards degrowth in the rich countries. That would be a good thing. Uh, no, of course, the reason they don't do it, aside from the fact they would lose the next election, is that uh, in a capitalist system, employment is dependent upon growth. So that the political forces that get set in motion by virtue of the endless growth dynamic of capitalism support the endless growth of, uh, of capitalism. And again, the critique here in the diagnosis and critique is that this is inconsistent with sustainability as a core value. Well, we've got the moral foundations. We have the diagnosis and critique. What should we do about it? Can we think about an alternative? It's always possible, of course, that there's all these things wrong and with capitalism and every alternative is even worse. You know, it doesn't follow just because you dislike a given social system because of the harms it generates that any alternative would reduce those harms. It's possible that alternatives wouldn't reduce harms for two kinds of reasons. One is that even if you could get there, the steady state of the alternative would actually have so many unintended and perverse consequences that it would make things worse. But it could also be that the only way to get there from here would make things so dramatically worse. Uh, so the fact that we've developed this diagnosis and critique is not sufficient to know that there are alternatives. It requires an independent argument that there are alternatives. To set up this problem, I think it's um, useful to draw a contrast between two ways of thinking about social systems, which I refer to as the organic system view of social systems and an ecosystem view of social systems. In the organic view of social systems, social systems are thought of like organisms. There's lots of parts. The parts all fit together. Every part has a function. Uh, Understanding how the system functions means understanding how all the parts fit together. An organism constitutes a totality in which there are no, or at least very few, extraneous parts. You know, there may be, because of evolutionary, the evolution of creatures, there may be occasional bits that don't serve any purpose. But by and large, uh, uh, an organic system, an organism system views the entire system as tightly integrated into a functional totality. Ecosystems are very different. They are what systems theorists would call loosely coupled systems. All the different elements of an ecosystem do affect each other, but they don't all serve functions for some whole. They just affect each other. Uh, some ecosystems are very robust. Uh, you can add an invasive species, an alien species, and that New species will just find a new little niche and just become part of the ecosystem with no problem. Other ecosystems are fragile. You put a particular invasive species and they take over. So ecosystems vary tremendously in their robustness, their fragility, and the extent to which they have lots of room for new elements. Some do, some don't. I think it's better to think of society that way. It's more like a pond than it is like an animal. It's more like a pond in which there is a variety of different economic processes operating under different economic logics. Capitalism is the dominant species in this pond, but there's lots of non-capitalist species as well coexisting. The actual system that we call capitalism in contemporary developed capitalist societies, are the actual systems are really hybrids. They combine capitalist and a range of non-capitalist forms. Uh, the idea of real utopias as a way of thinking about both alternatives and transformation fits more comfortably in an ecosystem view of society than the organ, um, organism view of society. In uh, thinking of real utopias in this way, the idea is that Real utopias identify institutions we can build in the world as it is that prefigure emancipatory alternatives that, um, that better realize equality, democracy, community, and sustainability. The search for real utopias is, to ser is the search for institutions that, that we can create inside of the spaces of the ecosystem of the capitalist pond, if you will, which represent anti-capitalist principles. They embody alternative values 
they may be confined, confined to small niches and not be able to grow. They may simply be nice little enclaves of alternative ways of life, or, and this is the aspiration of thinking of real utopias as both a strategy and an embodiment of alternative values, or they may increase the possibility of transforming the ecosystem as a whole, of building up these enclaves to the point where they begin to undermine the viability of the dominant species. In a way, this is more like how, in the Marxist tradition, people think about the transformation of feudalism into capitalism. In feudal society, capitalism emerges in the cracks and niches of the system. In the cities, it begins to serve certain kinds of purposes, when feudal lords see certain advantages and they, work, they get into cahoots with merchants, so they allow for greater expansion of certain kinds of proto-capitalist practices. Proto-capitalist meaning prefiguring an alternative way of life, but still encased within the constraints of feudalism. And over a very long period, several centuries, uh, feudal relations become less dominant and capitalist practices become more prevalent. Well, the idea of, all, of real utopias as a way of thinking about the transformation or the transcendence of capitalism is based on that same kind of core idea. Capitalism is a complex and contradictory system with lots of niches and cracks and spaces. Let's think about all the different ways we can build alternatives to capitalism inside of the world in which we live but in such a way that they also point to an alternative world in which we could live. Well, let me give you examples. I think um, examples are the way to give some flesh to this. Let's see where we are. Okay. I was told, by the way, that although officially the lecture part is supposed to go to 7.15 and then there's the reception, that actually we don't really have time constraints. Uh, I will, this isn't a license for me to go on forever, but I do really want to have discussion. And um, I probably have about 15 minutes or so left, but I think we can then have 20 minutes, 25 minutes of discussion afterwards. Let me just give you examples. So here's my full list of the examples that I've studied, that I work on. Um, let me say a little bit about each of them and a little bit more about some of them. So first, worker cooperatives. Worker cooperatives are the classic real utopian alternative to capitalism that gets built inside of capitalism. A worker-owned firm is a firm in which workplace dictatorships have been abolished. They're run on a one person, one vote. If they're large, they have uh, elected representatives that uh, serve on committees that um, monitor and control the management. Management is elected or selected by the workers in such a firm. Worker cooperatives have existed from the beginning of capitalism. In the 1840s, Proudhon thought they were the best way to attack and undermine capitalism in the famous debate between Proudhon and Marx over worker cooperatives as an alternative. Uh, worker cooperatives in a few places in the world are a strong and vibrant part of regional economies in the middle part of Italy and in certain parts of northern Spain, most notably. Uh, most places, there's, they occupy marginal niches within market economies. Now, one conclusion from that is they're just not viable. They can't survive in, a, in, the, in any kind of reasonable way in a market economy. Another interpretation is that they face very considerable obstacles uh, but those obstacles are remediable, and we can imagine a range of public policies that would expand the possibility of worker cooperatives. I'd be happy to talk about some of those in the discussion. Peer-to-peer -peer collaborative production. Wikipedia is my favorite example. It's a production process through which the world's largest encyclopedia was produced. Uh, just imagine, put yourself back in 2000 and one before it was launched. And somebody said, hey, I've got this great idea. Let's get several hundred thousand people from around the world to cooperate with each other without pay, we won't pay anybody anything, to write the world's biggest encyclopedia. And then let's make it free to everyone. And uh, no advertising. We won't allow any advertising. We'll rely on 
contributions from people who use and contribute to Wikipedia to cover the costs of its infrastructure and the staff that's needed to run it. And oh, by the way, within a decade, it will destroy a 300-year capitalist market in encyclopedias. <laughs> well, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, it violates every principle of economics. You can't have several hundred thousand people cooperate with each other. Imagine allowing high school students who are eager on some subject to edit the text of a professor. Mm. <laughs> Scandalous. And in any case, it'll produce a really lousy encyclopedia that nobody will use. Well, Wikipedia is the only website in the top 10 in terms of hits per day that is non-commercial. Uh, the essays, the entries are pretty good. They range from excellent to crummy. Uh, the ones that don't tap into some kind of political or ideological controversy, which is most of them, you know, most of the entries are, don't have that character, are excellent. Uh, a study by the magazine Science compared the error rate in the Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia, and they were very, very close. Not much difference. I uh, give Wikipedia writing assignments in my classes for professors in the audience. It's a fantastic assignment to, uh, to tell every student uh, your, your main assignment, writing assignment this semester is to publish something that will be in an international source and be read by potentially thousands of people around the world. And here's how you do it. And Wikipedia makes it easy. It's very easy. If you're interested in that, the um, one of the things I did as president of the American Sociological Association was create a, an ASA initiative on Wikipedia writing. So you can go to the ASA website and it'll direct you to a portal where you get um, instruction about how to use it in the classroom and, uh, and the procedures. And it works really well. I've done a couple of classes where um, that was what people did. They had to write, they had to add paragraphs to existing articles or write new articles. Um, urban agriculture with community land trusts. Well, ur urban agriculture and community gardens are a worldwide phenomenon that is increasing in intensity. It's, there's a kind of global social movement around urban agriculture. In the United States, in some of the old industrial collapsed cities like Detroit, and Milwaukee, it's a very big deal because the urban agriculture movement is not only serving a food kind of perspective. It's not just environmental, it's also a social justice movement uh, to create new uh, kinds of communities and new kinds of both employment and participation within the city. Uh, it, while I was here, I ran a, uh, a two-day seminar, and then yesterday, one of the tasks in the seminar where each of the students had to give a report on some real utopia in Australia, and one of the students gave a wonderful report about the Northeast Street City Farm. So naturally, I had to spend the first part of today with, uh, with Bill and Maria exploring this farm. Uh, the Northeast Street City Farm is, I think, a good example of what I'm talking about when I talk about real utopias. It's a way of organizing a community a agricultural activity that embodies the values of equality, democracy, community and sustainability, and it does so in a way that is self -con has a self-conscious mission of social transformation. So community gardens tend to have these, come in, have two sort of impulses. One is a lifestyle impulse. People just like gardening, and if they don't have a big enough yard or their, their yard isn't suitable, or they live in an apartment, well, a community garden is a practical solution to a lifestyle preference. And that's fine. And even there, there's a little whiff of real utopia because it does create more community. But the lifestyle version doesn't have as part of its purpose transformation. Well, the Northeast Street City Farm clearly has a social transformation agenda and one that I think is firmly um, real utopian. I'll just show you some pictures I took today because, you know, you, I'm in Brisbane. Brisbane is the site of a terrific real utopia. This is one of the best uh, social agenda community garden projects I've seen. 
Uh, this is the welcoming center. On Sunday morning, they have a cafe there, and uh, I'm told that their farmer's market from 6.30, I'm advertising them for them, <laughs> free advertising, from 6.30 to 10.30 is, is excellent. Uh, these are, this is the part of the community garden that uh, has individual plots. You can have an allotment there. Uh, these are some guys who are moving these wire fences, which they referred to as part of their chicken tractor technology, meaning they put these wire fences around part of the garden and let chickens loosen them for a few days who scratch up the soil and uh, help fertilize the plants. Uh, this is the um, kind of information board that says what's going on and who among the volunteers have, uh, are responsible for particular things. But also, I think, note the chairs and the integration of art as a central feature of the way they, the people who participate in this community of collective gardening, the way they think about what they're up to. What they're up to is making the world a beautiful place, not just a way of producing food. Uh, this was a, a blackboard illustration from some class that was taught about permaculture. That's one of the central objectives of this particular community farm urban farm is to spread the ideas and to cultivate knowledge about permaculture. And this is one of the art pieces. I thought this was just amazing. This is a face carved into the side of a tree uh, by one of the artists who uh, is a volunteer there. And this is the uh, post at the entrance uh, facing the direction when you leave, come back to Northeast Street City Farm. A Brisbane real utopia. Okay, let's, let me just quickly go through um, these others and just touch on some. Solidarity finance is a, um, a way of providing finance to small and medium firms that was developed by unions in Quebec. So unions around the world have pension funds. Mostly unions invest their pension funds like anybody invests their pension funds in mutual funds and other uh, fiduciary you know, instruments that live up to standards of fiduciary responsibility of the pension fund. In Quebec, 10% of pension funds are segregated from that kind of investment, that is investments that are primarily concerned just with maximizing returns for retirees, or, or maximizing secure returns, I think, low risk returns. 10% are allocated for proactive investment in small and medium firms as private equity investment. That is not buying shares, but directly investing in the firms in exchange for seats on the boards of directors. Solidarity finance is a way of increasing the collaboration between unions and small and medium business, but with the objective of creating a more democratically rooted form of capitalism, which is therefore more sub subject to uh, democratic accountability. Crowdsourced financing of projects. This is very new. It's a kind of very sexy new innovation. Uh, it, um, it's a way of mobilizing funds. I find it most interesting in the arts where you don't have to go to arts boards. You don't have to go to authoritative government or phil philanthropic agencies and plead with them to support your work. What you do is you go out to the general public of people who consume art and say, I've got this project. Help me fund it. And it's done in the internet. The, the standard way of doing it is saying, I need $30,000 for this project. People commit to a contribution, but the contribution only kicks in if the goal is reached. Uh, my daughter is a theater director, and she is funded in Philadelphia and New York. And she's funded a couple of her projects uh, through, um, not Kickstarter, it's a uh, Forget the, it's another one of those services, but it's a crowdsourcing. Uh, distribution, open access intellectual property, things like copyleft, the Creative Commons, open source pharmaceuticals. This is a brand, this is a new thing. I don't know that much about it, but it's a way of scientists saying that they are going to stop doing research that can be patented. They're going to follow the open source software movement and create open source pharmaceuticals. Well, that's pretty subversive, the capitalist property rights. And if it gets traction, uh, and if universities can be persuaded to uh, not seek 
royalties and patent rights for the inventions that come out of them, which seems like pretty far-fetched at Wisconsin these days. Uh, this would be a, a basis of a kind of anti-capitalist form of intellectual property around drugs. Internet-based gift economy and music. Uh, Yoki Bankler, who's a professor at Harvard, has been running some experiments that have the following character. You create a website for a musician that isn't a celebrity, but has a local fan base. So this is the idea is to create a way for musicians to not have to be celebrities that, um, in order to avoid being starving artists, right? So the class structure among musicians has this binary character. You're either greatly successful or you're a starving artist and you can't do your work. You have to do something else to live. Well, the idea is to create a website where your music can be downloaded and you don't charge anybody at all for downloading. Downloading is always free and then you ask for contributions. And the idea is you say, look, this is reciprocity. It's gift giving. I'm giving you my music. You can use it if you like it. That's fine. I need a certain income per month in order to keep producing music. Um, you have a meter on the thing which says a uh, rolling average, you know, the last 30 days, how much you've gotten. And you ask people to make uh, contributions. The experimental re results are that um, the average pay payment per download is higher than if you charged for it. And uh, you get a much more steady flow of income this way. But it requires that you create a fan base, so the artist has to perform in pubs and local music venues. So it reestablishes the principle that music making is to be done with people, with real live people. And then the modern technological versions is, are done through a gift economy of reciprocity rather than commodified charging for the music. Um, free publicly provided goods and services. Libraries. Now, libraries are a well-established institution. Libraries are incredibly anti-capitalist. They are communist institutions, to each according to need. You go into a library, you take what you want. Uh, if it's not available, what happens? You go on a waiting list. It's rationed by time, how long you have to wait for it. It's pure communism in its distribution. Uh, libraries are passionately defended in the United States by in local communities who think of it as just part of the natural order of things and don't realize what they're actually supporting. <laughs> uh, libraries, of course, can be expanded to, in, to provide much more than just books, and many libraries do. There are uh, libraries around the world where you can check out tools and the videos needed to know how to use them for home repairs. Uh, many libraries, of course, have videos and uh, music as well as books. In, in Madison, they have a, um, a s now a, you can check out paintings to put on your wall for a month, and they're sort of standard size frames, so you can every month have a different great painting on your wall. Uh, unconditional basic income. Uh, unconditional basic income is an old idea. Thomas Paine in the American Revolution proposed it. It's been around a long time. It's basically the idea that everybody, by virtue of their rights as a member of a community, should receive a monthly stipend sufficiently to live above the poverty line. Everybody gets a basic subsistence income, unconditional. You don't have to be virtuous. You just get it. Unconditional basic income. Uh, this is a good opportunity to mention that tomorrow, in the anthropology department, there's a seminar that John Altman, who's here, uh, is giving about basic income for indigenous Australians, uh, a, a government policy that didn't take the official form of basic income, but its actual implementation in practice functioned very much like a basic income, and it had the virtuous effects that theorists of basic income say it would have, which is why the government is deciding to dismantle it, of course. <laughs> Uh, so I uh, suggest, what, t what time is the uh, talk tomorrow? One o'clock tomorrow, a talk in anthropology. I'm sorry that I'll be flying eastward at that point, otherwise I would have been delighted to participate in that as well. Unconditional basic income has some really interesting ramifications. Uh, one way of thinking about unconditional basic income, it's a way of underwriting worker cooperatives. So think about it. Worker cooperatives have a fundamental problem, which is that workers have to eat. And 
when you're setting up a cooperative, it means that in the period where you're learning how to do it well, you also have to generate enough income in order to survive. Workers will not have typically the kind of savings that they can live off of their savings for an extended period while they get a worker cooperative running. Well, a basic income provides a bottom line subsidy of basic needs being met. It also therefore makes worker cooperatives much more attractive to banks for loans because they become more viable. The credit risk of lending to worker cooperatives goes down because of a basic income. Uh, basic income, therefore, would be a public policy to expand the sector of the economy that's most geographically rooted and therefore contributes and has the biggest stake in the prosperity and well-being of people in the particular area. Worker cooperatives, act, act, after all, are not firms that are going to move to, the, to a low-wage country just because they can produce less expensively. Um, well, I think I'm going to have to short circuit the, the last list. I want to wrap this up. These are examples. What do they all have in common in one way or another? They all contribute to a more democratic and egalitarian distribution of power. All of these examples involve shifts in the nature of power with respect to the allocation, accessibility, and use of resources than in capitalism. In one way or another, we could go through them and I could explain how in each case it works. All of these are transformations of the core power relations that constitute the nature of the power structure of a capitalist economy. And in that sense, I would argue, all of these constitute changes of class relations because class relations are above all power relations embedded in the economic structure. Wikipedia has a different class structure from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, the Northeast Street Community Garden City Farm has a different class structure. There's a different class structure of production than in an in agribusiness. These are transformations of class relations, but done inside of capitalism as a way of pointing beyond capitalism. Okay, let me just even more quickly uh, touch on the question of transformation. That's the fourth of our key tasks, right? Moral foundations, diagnosis and critique, elaboration of alternatives, transformation. There are three logics of transformation that have characterized anti-capitalist movements from the beginning. I refer to these as ruptural, interstitial, and symbiotic. Uh, those of you who know my work well, and especially those of you who have worked closely with me, know I like to label things and you know, introduce conceptual distinctions. For, uh, as advice to young sociologists, uh, one way to make your way in this cruel world of sociology is to introduce a new term. Your brand, it's a kind of branding of your intellectual work. Um, but it only is advantageous if other people like it, right? So yeah. <laughs> otherwise it just looks silly. <laughs> So neologisms either make you famous or make you look ridiculous. It's a risky <laughs> business. Uh, ruptural transformations. This is the view of social change, getting from here to there, in which transformation requires a radical disjuncture. There's a before and after. Smash first, build second. It's the strategy most identified with the revolutionary socialist and communist traditions. Interstitial transformations involve building new institutions in the cracks of the system. This is associated with various currents of anarchism historically. And symbiotic transformations involve using existing institutions to solve problems, but in ways that also transform those institutions. This is associated with the, at least the left of the social democratic tradition. For the 21st century, if you want to think of these three types of strategic logics, I think they fit together in the following kind of way. Ruptural strategies directed at capitalism as a system, that is as a whole, are implausible. That is the vision of a revolutionary seizure of power and a smashing of capitalist institutions in a very rapid disjuncture, I think that's an implausible scenario for a whole variety of reasons. But ruptures in specific institutions may be needed 
to open up possibilities for symbiotic transformations. Symbiotic strategies, then, are needed to expand the space for interstitial transformations. A symbiotic strategy that would expand the space for interstitial transformations, for example, would be changes in land use rules that would make it easier for community gardens to, um, to thrive. In Chicago, there is a social movement that's trying to develop a new form of community land trust, which would enable vacant land to be seized by the city through eminent domain and turned into community land trusts, which would be managed by community nonprofits for purposes of urban agriculture. That requires some legal changes. It's symbiotic because it helps solve problems in Chicago, problems of poverty, problems of marginalization and social disorder that would be helped, the argument goes, by building up these community-based institutions that had something really to do, like develop community gardens and community farms. And finally, interstitial strategies create the building blocks of emancipatory alternatives in the spaces created by these symbiotic processes. Conclusions. Real utopias are both a goal and a strategy. It's a goal because it's a way of articulating the kind of world we want. It's a strategy because it's a way of thinking about what we can build in the world as it is that moves us in that direction. Second, pervasive democratization is a central institutional task for transcending capitalism. When I first wrote the conclusion, I put the central institutional task, and then I decided I want to just pull back from a kind of primacy claim because inevitably, whenever I make such a claim, even though I actually think it is the central institutional task, it provokes unnecessary debate. Why is that more important than something else? OK, that's, whatever else is true, it is a central task for transcending capitalism. Third, institutional pluralism and heterogeneity. This is the idea that a democratic economy is realized in many different institutional forms. That list of examples I gave is all over the place. There's many different institutional forms, not one single form. This is really crucial to think about because it means the older idea of revolutionaries that we, there was one kind of model that could solve all the problems is simply incorrect. There are a set of very limited principles that get instantiated, but instantiated in very different ways depending upon the particular problem to be solved. Fourth conclusion, which I haven't elaborated that much in this discussion, but in the in the book from which these ideas are developed, in which these ideas are developed further, I spent a lot of time talking about number four, strategic indeterminacy. There's no one best way to get from here to there. There are many different paths. And the key task for activists and for their you know, theoretical comrades, uh, or their real comrades, but who work on theory, not the yeah. <laughs> uh, is to <laughs> is to try to understand the way context shapes strategy rather than to have a kind of one-dimensional universal strategic vision. And finally, going back to 1962 and the dismal future announced in that Port Huron statement, the opacity of future limits of possibility. We cannot know in advance how far we can go in building alternatives within capitalism that push us beyond. We don't know what the future holds. The opening up of new possibilities can happen very rapidly. And what the limits that constrain seizing those times are uh, cannot be anticipated until we try it. Democratic experimentalism is really the only way in which we can push the limits and discover how far we can push beyond them. Thank you very much. This, by the way, was the, um, the logo for the American Sociological Association meeting last year when the theme was real utopias. And uh, it was a big struggle to get the art artistic team that worked for the ASA to come up with something that I found attractive. But when they did, I think this is really beautiful. So I like to use it as my.
closing image. Uh, Eric, I think I would like to join your observation. Sure. Um, and I think I, I'm, I don't have to stick by that. I think I'm mic'd. <laughs> so we ha but we do have roving mics. So um, if, if you have questions, can, can I ask you to, to perhaps um, put your hand up and, and can we use the roving mic? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised that you haven't put down the obvious commons that we have around us. All those free public access things such as bikeways, footpaths, road, parks, beaches, surely they should be in included sure. in your list. And I'm also surprised that you don't include circulation and communication. Now some of the things you've got in there such as Wikipedia, libraries, public access, it seems to me that a very important component of open access away from capitalism is the extent to which circulation and communication can be freely undertaken. Right. And then I think a lot of the future is in that particular direction. So when you put your five list up, I'd shift a few of your points away from your five and put a new one in, circulation and communication. I mean, I certainly think the uh, open access internet is, uh, is, is essential. Uh, uh, just one instance of communication, underlying communications infrastructure. And the fact that it's, um, it remains a public good uh, is crucial and is, you know, is fundamentally opens up space for alternatives. And I agree, uh, public goods in general, I mean, there is a, it, it's always easy in a talk to say, in the book I X, Y, or Z, right? Uh, there's a whole big category of public goods which are provided in capitalism in non-capitalist ways because capitalism cannot provide them. So every defender of capitalism acknowledges that there are some things that capitalism doesn't provide well. Um, but the, the typical neoliberal vision is that public goods are a very restricted space, whereas in fact they're a very expansive space. And that's a space which can be then occupied by initiatives to expand open access to these public goods and the, and the quality and diversity of the public goods themselves. Thanks very much. Um, we uh, live in a world now in which we're getting uh, ships that can carry 18,000 containers in one go and there are only about 12 ports in the world that can accept these ships but more will. We also live in a world in which cauliflower broccoli, perishable goods, can be produced more cheaply overseas than they can here. And I just wonder, in the analysis of capitalism, have we not taught the world too well and capitalism is in fact coming bottom up to us rather than coming top down as your analysis might suggest. Um, I'm not sure what you mean bottom up rather than top down. Oh. <laughs> I mean I have, uh, I have no problem whatsoever with the redistribution of wealth that's signaled by the development of the, th of the less developed parts of the world. Uh, the rich parts of the world are too rich. They're unsustainably wealthy. In their preoccupation with material consumption, the, um, the real <coughs> utopian ideal, in my view, the emancipatory ideal, is that high productivity is used to create free time rather than massive stuff. And capitalism and its mechanisms for organizing markets blocks that trajectory, blocks a free time intensive economy. It's, not po it's possible to do that in a market economy, just not in a market economy in which power is concentrated in the hands of owners of wealth. Uh, so I'm not particularly disturbed by the fact that developing countries are a threat to the prosperity of the rich countries. I think it's a good thing that our prosperity is threatened. It's just that our response to it needs to be a different one than is currently envisioned, not a defensive response to try to protect the level of consumption we have through you know, ever more aggressive forms of neoliberal global management, but rather to uh, chart a different kind of economy. Uh, so it, it's, <clears throat> there are a variety of ways in which the um, 21st century, I think, 
opens up po is, is clearly going to open up possibilities for a reconstruction of the of <coughs> economic activities within developed countries because of the ways in which economies of scale are declining, not increasing. There's all sorts of areas of production in which it's possible to produce locally, uh, in which small batches can be produced as inexpensively as large batches per unit because of the way information technology enables new production systems to be organized. And that allows for a recentering of certain kinds of production at a local level but not in a way that maximizes profits, in a way that would maximize the flexibility and time of people in those communities. Yeah, on. Sure. The last couple slides you were showing were making um, transformation, were making me think a little bit more about the work on um, gradual institutional change from Strake and Thielen and Jacob Hacker and other people. And I'm just wondering, when institutions, because institutions aren't static, they're dynamic and they're always changing a bit, and at times we're not always aware of how they're changing and shifting. I mean, this idea, for example, of policy drift where a policy might have been put in place and through the passage of time and other things going on and change occurring gradually, eventually that policy has done something quite different than what we were expecting it to do. And I guess I'm wondering, in the search for those real utopias, how do you search, continue to search for those real utopias, when maybe the, the pond and its shape is constantly changing. So you might think you have your little niche in there fighting for the cooperative, fighting for the real utopia, but in effect, those policies that you think that you're fighting against are changing as you're working towards changing other things. So, um, I mean, a lot of- too philosophical there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, w when you use the word policy, I assume you're mostly referring to public policy. A lot of real utopias are built in communities. By, they're built by people. W Wikipedia is not the result of a public policy that said we need to do things to encourage peer-to-peer -peer collaborative production. People saw the utility of the internet and took advantage of it to create something totally new. Um, the question of policy around many of these things is setting the parameters within which then people can do things constructively. So with respect to cooperatives, there's a range of public policies around credit markets which impede the development of cooperatives in most places. And it's uh, pretty straightforward to think of ways in which those policies could be changed. And I'm not sure exactly why the fact that if you change them and they facilitate the growth of cooperatives, and then 10 years from now, because of other changes in the finance system, they're no longer serving that purpose. Why that causes a particular problem. It just means that you have to be continually vigilant and monitoring the way in which these institutions work. And if they were democratically accountable, they would be trans changeable as the conditions change. The problem, of course, is that there's lock-in due to the kinds of interests and power relations that block subsequent adjustments. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, you mentioned that we should probably uh, be celebrating rather than worrying about stagflation. Um, yeah. And I just wondered if... Well, uh, that was meant as a little bit as a, um, as a joke, you know. No, I of course, <laughs> in, in, ter in terms of uh, resource depletion. But yeah, I, I wondered right. if, you, if you might say something about the risks and moral hazards of the status quo uh, in terms of, um, you know, that being an incentive for transformation, particularly in terms of issues like, uh, you know, the greatest moral challenge of the time. So we're in Queensland, which is climate change. So <clears throat> in my more optimistic moods, and I, I try to be optimistic, professional, you know, it's a kind of task. I think it's easy to be pessimistic. It takes real work to be optimistic. Uh, in my even less charitable moments, I say it's lazy to be pessimistic. It takes energy to be p optimistic. So in my more optimistic way of thinking about this, I think climate change might actually signal the doom of neoliberalism and open up the space for more democratic and egalitarian alternatives. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying this in a deterministic way or even really as a prediction but as a possibility. Uh, 
There's two kinds of responses that people talk about with respect to climate change. One is mitigation to actually undo the problem by controlling carbon emissions and eventually reducing them. And the other is adaptation. Say we can't do anything about that, but we're going to have to cope with it, so there's going to be adaptations. Uh, the adaptations are going to require an absolutely massive expansion of state spending. I mean, there's just no way around it. The, the Hurricane Sandy, <laughs> just as an iconic example, um, was massively destructive, and it's just the leading edge of what's likely to be a much more recurrent sort of phenomenon. And the, the building of seawalls, they've already started talking about it. You know, these new fancy Dutch engineered seawalls. The Dutch are very good at living below sea level. They know how to do it. They've perfected the technologies needed to live below sea level. Well, those technologies in the rich countries, not in the poor countries, not in Bangladesh, but in the rich countries, can be built, but they can't be built through the market. There's just no way. These are massive public works projects. They are public works projects which probably are the kind of functional equivalent of World War II. You know, a, a war is a public works project. It's basically massively deploying state capacity to reallocate the social surplus from private purposes to public purposes. Now, neoliberalism is inconsistent with that. So in a way, even though we live in a, still in the neoliberal era, we might begin to think that it's the, uh, near the end. It's going to exhaust itself. There's lots of indications that people, uh, and, and certain segments of policy elites also, are recognizing the end. It's just that the political forces have so consolidated around that older model uh, that they, are, um, they have a lock on power, especially in the United States, which is in this ridiculous political impasse at the moment. So if that's the case, then global warming will create opportunities, not just for the public goods needed to adapt to the catastrophes that will be unleashed, but also to uh, reintroduce democratic and egalitarian and social justice agendas into the process of building those public goods. Uh, so just as it historically is the case that uh, World War II ushered in an era of much more egalitarian redistributive and social justice policies, one might imagine, this is my optimistic mode, <laughs> that um, the, the public response to the challenges of global warming might do the same. But of course, there's other scenarios that we can imagine. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, in a different era, in talking about the future beyond capitalism, used the expression socialism or barbarism. And uh, barbarism is, of course, as a, you know, a, as a stand-in term for authoritarian and repressive, uh, elite protective rather than social justice strategies, it would also certainly be uh, possible. Um, and in my pessimistic <laughs> mood, <laughs> I would say that's the more likely outcome, just because of the way power relations are orchestrated. There's also, uh, if I may say, it, it's been an extremely male-dominated set. Of, we've had one woman. So I would like, uh, after years, if, if there's any women in the audience who would like to ask some questions, you, you, you have. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you, but but you're standing, and so and it, and it's not your fault that all the guys came in before you did. You no, know, <laughs> my question may even be a segue uh, into that concern. Um, I guess one of the things that I was struck by the talk uh, was the absence of agency. And I thought when maybe you got to uh, the discussion of transformation, that um, agency would enter there. And of course, we're all familiar with the, uh, you know, that terrible uh, uh, binary in sociology, structure versus agency. So I, I'm just wondering uh, whether you've sort of deliberately omitted agency or what your thoughts are on a um, 
theorizing about agency uh, from uh, the considerations that, that sure. you brought to this topic. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So you're, you're absolutely right that the transformation agenda is the place where I do discuss agency. The shadow of agency is there through the use of the word strategy because strategies are the strategies of collective actors. Um, and so although I didn't specify what the actors were that would initiate the strategies that I discussed, uh, that is the ruptural, interstitial, and symbiotic strategies. Nevertheless, that's the point in the analysis where a more systematic account of agency comes in. Now, my general perspective on agency is that in the contemporary world, the way to think about the, the agents that are involved in strategies of social transformation are, in the first instance, heterogeneous, not homogeneous, that it is not a class agent in the classical understanding, but it's agents whose lives are structured by class relations. Because what these struggles are all about is the transformation of, as I said, the power relations of the economy, which is struggles over the nature of class relations. So the kinds of collective actions that are involved involve people coming together uh, from heterogeneous positions in the society but with common purposes to transform those class relations. Uh, that's the way I would describe what happens when you build a community garden. Now, you don't normally think of community gardens as class struggles. The agents aren't collectively organized class actors. But what they're doing, when people from whatever groups and heterogeneous positions in the society come together to forge a community garden is engage in collective action to change the power relations over the use of land and the access of land of people in whatever the milieu might be. And that is a change in class relations. So I, I don't have a theory of agency in the sense of I can tell you in advance of any given context who are the collective actors and how are they going to form coalitions. Uh, on the symbiot that's on the interstitial strategies. On symbiotic strategies, organizationally, political parties and trade and unions remain the key kinds of collective actors that engage in struggles over uh, symbiotic possibilities, that is expanding the spaces rather than just occupying the spaces. The interstitial strategies occupy the spaces and the uh, symbiotic strategies expand the spaces by changing the policies that uh, define the, the rules of the game. And I think that has, at least at the present, that the collective actors are primarily parties and where they are still viable unions. Those are the strongest forms of collective actors from below. I mean, there's collective actors, there's elite actors, of course, organized as agents as well. Hi, well, actually, that was rather similar to what I was going to ask. Um, but on that topic, with the notable exception of the internet, as you mentioned before, a lot of these seem to be smaller scale examples of real utopias. And I was just wondering if uh, you knew of or you could see the possibility of larger uh, real utopias in a system where um, governments are outweighed by private sectors. Well, these aren't all small. I mean, um, you know, worker cooperatives, some of them are very, some of them are large. They're robust firms. Some are small. Some are have thousands of members. Uh, solidarity Finance uh, finances um, roughly a third of private equity investment in Quebec. So that's pretty big, you know, in the province of Quebec. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and public libraries was one example. That's a stand-in for public goods of all sorts that are in which there's free access, and, and that's a big kind of sector of activities organized through the state. So, so not all of these are, are small, but a lot of them are. And part of, the, I, you know, part of my idea in thinking about these things is to take seriously the notion um, that the replication of small initiatives becomes a big initiative. So 
you know, it's hard to imagine something smaller and more local than community gardens. But they're happening all over the world now. And they weren't happening all over the world in this way 25 years ago. Uh, and in some places, like Detroit, Detroit is a city that used to have a couple million people. It's down to 700,000. There are vast stretches of, new, of Detroit of abandoned property. Uh, in Detroit, the movement is to have a very big scale of urban agriculture, but which would still be community-led as opposed to agribusiness. So there are opportunities, even for the community garden type urban agriculture, for it to be scaled up. But I think scaling up through replication is still scaling up. Makes, uh, and, and that's, after all, fundamentally the way capitalism developed, again, to invoke that historical analogy, which is deeply flawed in all sorts of ways because of, for those of you who know the history would easily identify. Nevertheless, it's evocative. Um, capitalism replicated itself because it worked. It solved problems in all sorts of local venues. And then the cumulative effect of those disaggregated but aggregating uh, initiatives became a system changing initiative. And that's, I think, the, at least part of how we have to think about uh, transcending capitalism. Uh, Eric, thank you back here very much. Appreciate that. Um, one thing that st stood out to me with the food production was, have you thought about freeganism? Um, I don't, I'm from Chicago, and I know, and I guess a PhD student, so I'm always looking for a free meal. They have dumpster diving and people that are creating communities to then go to, for example, behind uh, grocery stores, and they're actually actively picking but they cross a lot of divides. It's very educated people doing this. It's people of different gender. Right. It's sort of a very interesting thing to me that it's sort of hype in the system and it's going back to it and right. it's sort of picking that. I wonder if that's one topic that so, you've considered. Yeah, so there's lots of cool things happening in the world um, which are oppositional to the world as it is, but which are not prefigurative as the world that we might want. That is, I don't imagine as an alternative to capitalism, dumpster diving. <laughs> you know, that is, I don't see this as a model, scavenging off of the refuse of others. I don't see that as a model for how to organize um, the conditions of life for human flourishing. So my egalitarian premise is all people should have equal access to the social and material conditions necessary for human flourishing. I don't think of human flourishing will be promoted by imagining a world of scavengers. Now, the recycled aspect, the no waste aspect, that particular face of freeganism is of course desirable. It's part of general environmental you know, sensibility. But the freegan institution, that way of dealing with no waste and recycle, that particular way, scavenging and dumpster diving, is cool. It's nice and oppositional. I don't think it's prefigurative, particularly. You know, that would be my judgment. Um, but I might be wrong about that. You know, I mean, I've, uh, I used to, for example, uh, be pretty dismissive of local currencies. You know, the, the various devices that have occurred in some places to have time-based currencies as an alternative to standard currencies. And I never took them seriously. I thought they were you know, they were kind of hippie-ish, you know, they're kind of cool things to do that would just be part of your retreat from the existing world rather than transformative. But uh, I've re more recently been discussing with people who have studied it and studied it's more the places where it's more extensive because there are some parts of the world, Basel, Switzerland apparently, has a very big alternative currency which uh, organizes a very large part of, um, or a significant part of the local economy. And it's pretty interesting because it does create a, an egalitarian premise of the basis for exchange. An hour is an hour, doesn't matter who performs it. And you have an accounting system and you have banks, you have a bank so you can get hour credits, you can borrow hours. You know, you need a credit system in a alternative currency in order for it to work smoothly. And apparently it works pretty well. So my skepticism about alternative currencies has been muted more recently. I don't, you know, I don't feel, 
I, I haven't studied it directly, so I'm not sure. But uh, so maybe dumpster diving is the future of. <laughs> I, I'm going to actually undemocratically have to call to a close, and, and, and um, I, I do apologise for that because um, I, I know there are more questions, and it, it has been a, a fascinating talk as as, as always. Very thank, thank you, Mark. You. Um, uh, can I just ask um, all of you to um, once more thank Eric? Uh,